Well, good morning. Uh, please turn in your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 40 to 45. Mark chapter 1, and beginning at verse 40. <clears throat> Let us hear the word of our God. And the leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. Let us pray. Father, in your light, we see light, and so we pray that this morning you would illuminate the reading and the preaching of your word so that we would see Jesus more clearly, love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly. And it's in his name that we ask, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever praised. Amen. Many years ago, uh, during a trip to Tanzania, uh, I visited a Maasai camp. Uh, the Maasai are a nomadic people uh, group in Kenya and Tanzania who roam the dusty plains of East Africa, shepherding their cattle and hunting wild animals. When they settle in a particular place for a time, they build uh, some mud huts and surround them with a wood uh, fence made of thorn bushes to protect them from the wild animals at night. As a people group, they remain a fascination to anthropologists and sociologists, to tourists and even local Tanzanians, because they've never really integrated into modern day African society. They keep themselves very much to themselves. Well, on this particular trip to Tanzania, myself and some friends decided to do a touristy thing, and that was to go and visit a Maasai camp. And as we were walking around the camp with our translator and the Maasai man who was explaining about life in the village, I noticed a little boy off to the side, lying beside the fence. He was about two to three years old. He was naked. He was on his own. And as I approached him, I noticed that he was tied to the fence by a bit of tree bark that was tied around his wrist and connected to the thorn bush. At first sight, I couldn't quite work out what it was that I was seeing. And as I got a little bit closer to him, I saw that his eyes were glazed over and teary. His, ro his nose was runny. He sounded like he had a chesty cough. He looked dreary and malnourished. As he sat there, he looked at me and motioned for me to help him, to feed him with something, to pick him up. And so I continued to walk towards him. But as I did so, the Maasai man and the tour guide started to shout at me to stay away from the boy. I was informed that he was possessed by an evil spirit and that he had to be quarantined for a time until the spirit left him. No one was allowed to touch him. No one was allowed to speak to him. I remember later on during the tour, seeing a woman in the camp go over to him with some food. She had some mealy meal on a metal plate, and she put the plate on the ground and kicked it towards him. We were informed that a little boy slept outside at night, still tied to the fence. The men of the village would surround him with thorn bushes to protect him 
from the wild animals like hyenas and lions. Some of the men would take turns checking on him through the night. But he would spend the night alone outside. We asked how long this would be for, and they said perhaps two to three weeks, however long it takes for the evil spirit to leave him. To us, he just looked like he had malaria or a fever or a flu. But in the Maasai culture, it was believed that even those kind of illnesses were symptoms of an evil spirit. I remember as we drove away that day from that Maasai camp, feeling physically sick. It's one of the most horrible pictures of exclusion that I have seen. Complete and utter exclusion. Outside, alone, excluded. In the West, we can't really identify with something like that, can we? I'm sure we may have experienced exclusion as kids when we weren't invited to that birthday party or we weren't picked on that sports team. Or perhaps as teenagers, we felt a little excluded from the cool people at school because we didn't wear the right clothes or listen to the right kinds of music. Or perhaps as students at college, we felt the exclusion when we were on the outside of some society or fraternity. Perhaps as adults, we have felt the exclusion in the workplace for being a Christian or for holding a certain view of marriage in society. But whatever kind of exclusion we may have experienced in our life many years ago or recent, let's be honest, doesn't doesn't compare to what that little boy felt in that Maasai village for those two to three weeks. What he experienced was total and utter exclusion. No talk, no touch, no embrace, just exclusion. And it is that kind of intense, vivid exclusion that we need to see and feel this morning if we're going to understand this passage from Mark's gospel. Because this leper in Mark chapter 1 verse 40 was excluded from his society just like that little Maasai boy was. In the first century, leprosy was an all-encompassing term for a bunch of different skin diseases. Even even if you just had a, a swollen or flaky or itchy skin or eczema or psoriasis, you were counted as a leper, and therefore you were excluded. So it wasn't hard to be diagnosed with leprosy. It wasn't hard to be excluded in that society. It was quite a common disease. But leprosy was not so much a medical condition as it was a social condition. Even though leprosy itself was not contagious, if you had leprosy, everything you touched was viewed as contaminated. If you lived in a house, anyone who entered the house was viewed as unclean, so you lived alone. If you stood under a tree, and anyone walked under the same tree, it was viewed that they became unclean, so everyone avoided you. If you went to the synagogue, you had to sit at the back behind a veil, otherwise you made others unclean, so you were excluded. And so if you had leprosy, no one wanted to come near you. You were cast out, alone, excluded. You lost your name, you lost your job, you lost your family, you lost your home, you lost your community. Leprosy was, in this sense, a social sentence of exclusion, more than a medical diagnosis of illness. In short, if you had leprosy, you were sentenced to a life of exclusion. The sentencing was actually based on God's Old Testament law in the Old Testament. Leviticus 13, verse 45 and 46 reads, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. 
You hear the language of exclusion? Unclean, alone, outside. That was the sentence that hung over the leper in the first century AD. And it wasn't easily removed either. Believe it or not, leprosy was viewed as more difficult to cure than raising the dead. In fact, lepers were known as the living dead. They were like walking corpses, dead men walking, dead women walking. And then to top it all off, leprosy was viewed as having a spiritual dimension to it as well. By Jesus' time, it was believed that leprosy was a sign of divine punishment from God. And so if you had leprosy, life couldn't really get any worse. You were cast out by society. You were excluded by family. You were punished by God. Now, only when we understand that background to leprosy and the stigma that went with it socially and spiritually, only when we understand all of that will we understand this short story in Mark's gospel. For a start, what the leper does in verse 40 breaks all the rules and customs of the day. And a leper came to Jesus. Those first six words don't really shock us, but they were massively shocking in the first century. Lepers were supposed to observe a 50 pace rule. They were to stay 50 paces from any other person, so no six foot social distancing. This was 50 foot plus social distancing. That's what they had to observe. But here is this leper breaking all the conventions and customs of the day because he is so keen to get to Jesus. And the manner in which he comes to him shows this. And the leper came to Jesus imploring him and kneeling before him. His urging shows his desperation. His posture shows his humiliation. And notice exactly what he wants from Jesus, verse 40. If you will, you can make me clean. He doesn't want healed. Did you notice that? He doesn't say, if you are willing, you can heal me. No, he says, If you are willing, you can clean me. It's not healing that he's after. It's cleansing. The word appears four times in verse six, uh, sorry, four times in these six verses to underscore the point. If you glance down to verse 40, if you will, you can make me clean. Verse 41, and Jesus said to him, I am willing, be clean. Verse 42, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Verse 44, and Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. Cleansing, not healing. That's what he wants. Cleansing is ritual language, not medical language. It's a religious term. It is connected to being included and excluded from the community of God's people. This man had spent his days walking around saying what the Old Testament law taught him to say, unclean, unclean. And because of that, he was excluded. That's why he wants to be cleansed. Because if he can be cleansed, then he can be included again in society. If if he can be cleansed, then he can have his name back. He can have his job back. If he can be cleansed, then he can go home and sit and eat and laugh and talk with his family. If he can be cleansed, then he can be hugged again. In a word, he can be embraced. He can be embraced. But the only way for him to be embraced is if he is cleansed. Just like that little boy tied to the fence in that Maasai village. The only way he was ever going to be embraced again was if his family believed that he had been cleansed of his evil spirit. Well, same with this leper. The only way he can be embraced is if he is cleansed. 
That's what this story is all about. It's about the movement from exclusion to embrace. The movement from exclusion to embrace. This story of the leper is a small window into the good news message of Christianity. It's like the gospel in miniature, packed into just six verses. As sinners born into this world, we are like this leper, unclean and outside and under the wrath of God, born under his punishment. We are born into this world with God, not as our loving father, but as our angry judge. We're born into this world shut out from his heavenly paradise, just like Adam was shut out from the garden paradise after he sinned. He was excluded because he had become unclean. And so too are we. We are born east of Eden. We are born excluded from God's garden paradise because we are born unclean. And we are unclean because we are sinners. And yet the great drama of redemptive history, the great love story of the Bible, is that because of God's great love for sinners, we can move from exclusion to embrace. From exclusion to embrace. And this short story of Jesus and the leper gives us four insights into that movement as sinners from exclusion to embrace. Number one, Jesus' embrace comes through his compassion. Jesus' embrace comes through his compassion. Verses 40 and 41. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. The leper has expressed his desire to be cleansed, and now it all turns on Jesus. But note that the leper doesn't appeal to Jesus' power to cleanse him, to Jesus' ability to cleanse him. No, he knows he has the power. You can make me clean. The question is, does Jesus have the will? The leper appeals to Jesus' heart, to whether or not Jesus wants to clean him, not whether he can clean him or not. And Mark shows us what the heart of Jesus is like. Verse 41, I am willing. Be clean. Jesus responds to this outcast, not with contempt, not with condemnation for breaking the 50 pace rule, but with compassion. With compassion. The word pity in the ESV is not a great translation. It's a bit weak. Uh, We can pity someone and we can patronize them. But here the word pity relates to a deep inward groan. Jesus feels pangs in his heart for this man. The man's plight filled Jesus' heart with deep grief, moved with compassion. Some translations say moved with indignation. That is, Jesus was angry at his situation. He became impassioned about it. The impassable Son of God who is without passions as incarnate man becomes impassioned. This leper was cast out. He was alone. He was unclean. He was discarded and rejected and despised by his society. But Jesus had compassion on him. Jesus felt for him. And deeply so. This is the first step to a sinner being embraced by Jesus. It begins with Jesus' compassion. The embrace of Jesus comes through his compassion for us in our outcast, excluded, damnable state of sin. Our sin is like leprosy. It leaves us excluded and without hope in this world. And yet we are not without hope. Because Jesus is full of compassion to needy sinners. This is the first step to how we as sinners move from exclusion to embrace. 
Jesus' embrace comes through his compassion. Second, Jesus' embrace comes through his holiness. It comes through his holiness, verses 41 and 42. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Rather than turning away from this leper, as everyone in society would have done as he approached them, Jesus turns toward him. But more than that, he stretches out his hand and touches him, verse 41. Now just think about that for a moment. We skirt over a comment like that, but think about it. This man hasn't felt human touch for months, perhaps years. Just think about what that sensation must have felt like for him. Up to this day, he had always had a 50-pace gap between himself and others. And now here is someone reaching out and touching him. I mean, talk about a picture that paints or speaks a thousand words. Because Jesus doesn't need to touch him. This man hasn't asked Jesus to touch him. He knows if Jesus is willing, he only has to speak the words and he will be clean. In fact, that's what Jesus does. He speaks, I am willing, be clean. And immediately he was clean. So why the touch? Why the touch? Because Jesus wants to demonstrate visibly to this man and to all onlookers that he is not just healing this man of leprosy. He is cleansing him. He is removing all social and religious barriers for him to be embraced again in society. With a touch, Jesus removes the physical, social, spiritual barriers that excluded this man from the community of God's people. The cleansing happens by the will and power of Jesus, but the means by which that will and power are conveyed is a touch. A touch. And notice through this touch, Jesus doesn't become unclean. The leper becomes clean. Jesus' touch cleanses the leper. The leper is cleansed by Jesus' cleanness, if you like. By Jesus' holiness. What's contagious here is not the leprosy, but Jesus' holiness. When you get touched by Jesus, you contract his holiness. There is a sense in which Jesus' command, be cleansed. Is Jesus doing for this leper what the priest could never do? In the Old Testament, priests could pronounce clean or unclean on a person. But here is Jesus doing more than pronouncing. He is commanding. And with his touch, he is cleansing. Jesus acts here like a priest, but in in an order far greater than that of the Levitical priesthood. He does what the Levites could never do. Indeed, he does what only God could do. Because in the Old Testament, there are only two healings of leprosy, Miriam's and Nahum's, and in both cases, it is God who cures them. And now here is Jesus doing what only God can do, cure a man of leprosy. But remember, it's more than a cure. It's a cleansing. Jesus embraces this leper by giving him his own cleanness, his own religious and spiritual holiness, so that he can be incorporated back into the community of God's people. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of Christ's righteousness being imputed to the sinner. So often we explain the gospel in forensic terms, and that's fine. It's a very Pauline way to do it. But the gospel writers express the exact same gospel in relational terms. This man's embrace, his justification, comes through the touch of Jesus' holiness. And that's the picture of the gospel. Jesus' embrace of us as sinners, comes through his holiness. 
But it also comes through something else. It comes through Jesus' exclusion. Jesus' embrace comes through his compassion. It comes through his holiness. And third, it comes through his own exclusion, or we might say at the expense of his exclusion. Verse 43 and 40 to 45. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, shew yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, to spread the good news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was outside in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. We're meant to see and feel the stark contrast here in verse 41. Jesus is acting with compassion, speaking and tenderly touching this man. And next thing, two verses later, he's speaking sternly to him. Sounds a bit confusing, doesn't it? Why does Jesus not want people to know about this event? I mean, isn't this why he came? To show people that he was God's king who had come to inaugurate God's kingdom? And what a beautiful picture of the dawning of God's kingdom, where outcasts are brought in, where the excluded are embraced. I mean, come on, Jesus, what's the problem? Have you forgotten your father's memo? Well, if you take the time to read Mark's gospel, you see that this is a constant theme in the first half of Mark's gospel, the self-disclosure of Jesus that is hidden at first. In chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, Jesus tells the unclean spirit to be silent after the spirit identifies him. In chapter 1, verse 34, he won't let the demons speak because they know who he is. In chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, Jesus speaks, uh, orders the spirits not to make him known. In chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, Jesus tells his disciples, that the secret of the kingdom has been given only to them. In chapter 5, verse 43, he tells his disciples not to tell anyone that he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He sort of just wants people to think, to go on thinking that she was just sleeping. Chapter 7, verse 36, he tells the deaf man whose ears he has opened not to tell anyone. Chapter 8, 26, he tells a blind man not to go back to the village to tell people about him. Chapter 8, verse 30, he strictly charges his disciples not to tell anyone that he is the Christ. See him again in chapter 9, verse 30. So what's going on here? Why the big secret? Well, I think for two reasons. First, Jesus doesn't want to create a messianic fever around himself too early. He wants to keep his identity a secret for strategic reasons. Because the more the Jewish leaders and the Romans hear about him, the more they're going to seek to kill him. So in some ways, he's timing his own death, ensuring he dies when he's ready to die. This is why he tells the man to go and present himself to the priest and to offer the sacrifices required for cleansing in the law of Moses. Because the time for the end of the law is not yet. Jesus is the great high priest, and yet he is deferring this man back to another subordinate priest. Why? Because the time is not yet. Jesus will soon do away with all of these laws through his death and resurrection, but the time is not yet. So that's the first reason I think he does this. Second, and perhaps more significantly, He does not want a mistaken identity. He doesn't want messianic fever created just yet, but neither does he want to be misunderstood as the wrong kind of Messiah. If the Jews hear that he is the Holy One of God, God's Son, they will misunderstand him as a political Messiah, come to fight the Romans. They will want him to create a movement and defeat the Romans. But Jesus wants people to know that his proper identity cannot be understood merely from his miracles 
or even just from his preaching. His full identity will only be revealed at the cross when he dies. Isn't that what the Roman centurion says? When Jesus breathed his life, the centurion said, Surely this man was the Son of God. So I think Jesus withholds his identity from people because if that identity is revealed too early, then he will be crucified too early. And secondly, that identity can only really be understood in the light of the cross, as even Simon Peter and others will soon discover. So that is why I think he sternly charges this leper not to tell anyone, because the time for him to be fully known is not yet. However, verse 45, the cleansed leper doesn't heed the warning. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was outside in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. You see the result of the man's disobedience? Through Jesus' holiness, this leper has been cleansed and embraced. But now, through the leper's disobedience, Jesus becomes excluded. Notice the wording. He could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. Literally, he was outside in desolate places. Do you see the exclusion Jesus now experiences? Jesus starts his ministry in, in Mark chapter 1. He starts on the inside, going in and out of synagogues freely, with a leper on the outside, not able to move openly and freely. But now Jesus is on the outside. And the man is on the inside. Because this man doesn't do what Jesus told him to do, Jesus is excluded. But there's another reason. According to the law, if you touched or came into contact with an unclean person, like a leper, you became ritually, legally, socially unclean. You became an outcast and excluded. And that's what happens to Jesus here. He cleanses this man through his own cleanness, through his own holiness. But that embrace comes at a cost. It results in Jesus' own exclusion. If we put the two together, we could say that this leper is embraced through Jesus' holiness and through Jesus' exclusion. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel in which sinners are justified before God, embraced by God on the basis of Jesus' perfect righteousness and also on the basis of Jesus becoming a curse for us, being forsaken by God for us, being excluded. There's a beautiful twist, though, even in Jesus' exclusion. wonder, did you notice it at the end of verse 45? And people were coming to him from every quarter. Jesus' exclusion to desolate places draws many people to him. They start coming to him from everywhere. The geography reveals the theology. The geography reveals the theology. Jesus is cast out into desolate places so that sinners can come to him for embrace. He is excluded so that they can be included. And this pattern of exclusion to desolate places for the inclusion of desperate sinners, ultimately it comes to its climax in Golgotha, the desolate place where Jesus dies on a cross. Golgotha becomes the ultimate desolate place for Jesus, the place of exclusion by God. And yet, when he is lifted up on the cross, on that desolate hill, abandoned and forsaken by God and men, he begins to draw all people to himself, beginning with a Gentile Roman centurion. Surely, this is the Son of God. 
And ever since, people from every tribe and language and nation have been coming to Jesus by faith on that desolate hill called Golgotha. This story of the leper is the gospel in miniature. It is a beautiful picture of what Jesus does for sinners like you and me. He embraces us through his own exclusion. But the embrace requires something on our part. It requires that we come to Jesus in faith, just like this leper did, which brings us to our fourth and final point. Jesus' embrace comes through his compassion, through his holiness, through his exclusion. And finally, Jesus' embrace comes through faith in him. Through faith in him. Verse 40, and a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you, you can make me clean. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you will, you can make me clean. That is a statement of faith. The leper believed Jesus was able to cleanse him, and so he asked him to do it. The law could only condemn this leper. The law could only pronounce the words unclean over this leper. The law couldn't fix the leper's problem of exclusion. It could only condemn him in it. It could only confirm him in it. But Jesus could cleanse the leper. And the leper knew it and believed it. And so he begged Jesus to do it. In other words, the leper's movement from exclusion to embrace came through faith in Jesus. He believed Jesus had the power to cleanse, but also that he had the will to cleanse. If you are willing, you can make me clean. He came in faith. And the great good news for us today is that the Jesus of the first century is still the Jesus of the 21st century. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means that his desire to cleanse sinners, to embrace the excluded, has not changed or waned one bit. He remains an impassioned Savior, longing to save all those who come to him by faith, longing to touch sinners with his holiness, longing to declare them clean because he became unclean for them. Jesus is still willing to embrace the excluded. The question that each of us need to ask ourselves this morning is, have we experienced the embrace of Jesus? If not, it's not because he's not willing. You know, as I look back on that incident in the Maasai village many years ago, I have a deep regret. And that is that I stopped approaching that little boy as he motioned to me for help. I wanted to touch him, to embrace him, but I was unsure whether I'd contract something from him. I wanted to give him a drink, but I lacked the courage to go against the misguided beliefs and cultural customs of the Maasai. I left that village that day with a deep regret. I wish I had embraced that little boy. I wish I had helped him. My problem was that I wasn't willing enough to help him, to embrace him. You know, Jesus has never had such a regret. Never once. Because every person whoever came to him asking for help, he helped them. He embraced them. And a leper came to Jesus imploring him and said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched the leper and said to him, I am willing, be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him, 
and he was clean. Have you experienced Jesus' embrace? If not, it is not because he is unwilling. Let us pray. I'm going to close with a prayer by Gregory of Nyssa. Kindness flows from you, Lord, pure and continual. You had cast us off as was only just, but mercifully you forgave us. You hated us and you were reconciled to us. You cursed us and you blessed us. You banished us from paradise and you called us back again. You took from us the fig leaves that had made so unseemly a garment, and you put on us a cloak of great value. You opened the prison gates and gave the condemned a pardon. You sprinkled us with clean water and washed away the dirt. Never again, after all this, will Adam blush when you call him. Never will he try to hide because his conscience reproaches him. Never will he seek concealment under the trees in the garden. The flaming sword will never more whirl about the walls of paradise and cut off the entrance from those who approach it. For us that were heirs to his sin, all has been changed to rejoicing. For man now has access to paradise and even to heaven itself. The whole creation, heaven and earth, is at one again in friendship. Its former differences forgotten. Men join their voices with the angels and echo the angels' praise of God. There is no doubt who it is that dresses the bride in her finery. It is, of course, Christ. He that is and was and will be. Blessed is he now and throughout the ages. Amen.